Committee to National Washington, D.C. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is uh, James Love. I'm the uh, director of an organization called Knowledge Ecology International. We have offices in Washington, D.C. and in Geneva, Switzerland, and I followed um, international negotiations on intellectual property rights uh, pretty, pretty uh, intensely since around 1994. Really, really before that, but, but uh, it, it's been a, a big focus of my work since then. Um, uh, we, we do a lot of research and policy analysis as it relates to intellectual property rights innovation policy. We focused a lot in the past on issues about HIV and AIDS, particularly when there was uh, uh, tens of millions of people that were infected with HIV in developing countries that were not getting access to treatment, as opposed to today when there's a, about 8 million people on treatment in developing countries. 8 million people after the patent issue was basically resolved. 8 million people that are not dead because, uh, uh, because of a, a rather intense and far-flung international struggle to deal with the uh, problems of, of, of high-priced drugs uh, for HIV. Um, uh, during that period, I remember uh, HIV drugs cost around $10,000 in South Africa, 10 to $15,000. Company has been pressed to offer things like 30% discounts off the U.S. price in Africa. Almost no patients were really uh, on the drugs at the time. But that was radically changed. You can now buy HIV drugs, good regimes for about under $100. And, and, and most of the major companies have voluntarily licensed their patents to the medicine's patent pool. Clean Roche, Pfizer, uh, Gilead, uh, GSK, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, and some other companies, and, and the NIH, and uh, uh, <clears throat> for the vast majority of patients. So there's been a big, a big change in that area was led by really dealing with the patent issue, but then it led to a completely different attitude about access in that area. Today with cancer drugs, we're kind of back to the period we were, a period they're showing documentaries about, about this horrible period for the HIV drug, where the world was basically crazy, it didn't notice all these, all these, all these people in Africa and other developed countries dying. Now, what's happening with cancer drug is pretty much like the way things were back then. And India's taking like a little baby step forward and you've got <clears throat> the Congress all up in arms and all these people in the committees and Bayer making this statement. I think it's good that Bayer made the statement. Uh, I'm a, um, I was a voluntary expert witness in the Bayer NATCO case uh, uh, on behalf of the generic company. Uh, it, was a, it was a case not brought by the government, it was brought by uh, NATCO, a, very, uh, a small generic company that makes cancer drugs in India. Um, uh, I'm also the author of the 2005 Renumeration Guidelines for Royalties on Compulsory Licenses, published by UNDP and the World Health Organization. I'm the chairman of Essential Inventions, an organization uh, that's been involved in some compulsory licensing cases in the United States. I've worked with a number of developing countries, including the South Africa Competition Commission, in abuses of allegations of patents on AIDS drugs. Um, uh, I've been involved in two compulsory licensing cases in the United States which were successful and uh, two that were not. Uh, 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 I work uh, on a number of trade negotiations involving research and development, including a proposed research and development treaty that would increase the sustainable levels of R and global R&D funding, an initiative that the United States government has basically opposed internationally and to which India has generally been supportive of. Now, the WTO was supposed to be a bargain uh, at the time. If you read all the literature, the negotiators and people like that, the idea is that India would agree to these tough rules on, on intellectual property, and then there would be these market access provisions. India agreed to the TRIPS agreement. A lot of people were very critical of India at the time. Uh, people like uh, Joseph Stiglitz say it was a big mistake that that was put in, uh, and, and another uh, academics that, in the WTO, but there it is, it's, it's an agreement. Now, a lot of witnesses the last, uh, two days of hearings have, have basically complained. They said that the WTO uh, rules weren't really followed um, by India. And 
The only reason you're having this hearing is because the, the government has no case before the WTO. They wouldn't have to come to you, you folks. They would bring a case to the WTO if they thought that Section 3D of the Indian Patent Act or if their compulsory licenses were somehow not compliant with WTO rules. Because the WTO has a dispute resolution process and they can enforce uh, their agreement. The U.S. doesn't bring the agreements uh, to the WTO because they think either they have no case at all or they have a case that can go either way and probably go against the United States, even if it's somewhat ambiguous. So I think what you're really being asked to do is to do things that the WTO can't do. Now, the, the major thing that you're going to talk about today is whether or not India taking steps to have generic manufacturing drugs, it's not the only issue, but it's one of the things that's led to this hearing, uh, cheap drugs for cancer in particular, the Gleevec case and the Nexar case are both cancer drugs, whether or not that, that uh, triggers some kind of sanctions against India. Now Bayer, <coughs> uh, uh, Julie Cochran didn't mention this, but they were charging about $65,000 a year, about $5,600 a month in India for Nexavar. Uh, now, uh, 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 that is a, uh, that, was, that was basically the initial position on the, on the case. If you, if you look at the press in India, if you read the opinion of the case in India, if you, if you follow the uh, statements of the chairman of, uh, of Bayer, it was really about the excessive pricing part of the case. Now the companies have a really kind of uh, erased that out of everybody's memory in their 301 submissions, their submissions here, because it, it doesn't sound really uh, like a good topic for them to talk about. But uh, I'd just like to put it in perspective. Um, what would $5,600 a month in, in India look like if you were in the United States? Well, if, if you look at the ratio of the price to the average per capita income, that would be a price in the United States of $183,000 a month for the drug, or $2.2 million per year for the drug. Now, if Bayer was charging $183,000 every month for a drug, you'd take the rest of your life, and almost nobody, according to Bayer, 2% of the people that need the drug were getting it from them at the time. Would you be really shocked if the United States didn't intervene at the price of that? I wouldn't. Well, that's what India did. And that's really basically what the issue is. If you stop India from issuing compulsory license and, and promoting domestic production, you're basically going to kill people that have cancer, not just in India, but throughout the world. There's a woman here today. Her name is Nina. Ma, ma, uh, I always say her last name wrong. Uh, Nina uh, Magamut. Would you stand up just a second? And Nina is from Florida. She contacted me like last week because she saw my name in the paper about this drug. And her father-in-law lives in Egypt. He makes less than $300 a month. The price of Nexavar, he has liver cancer. If he has liver cancer, he's taking Nexavar. It costs $900 a week. They've now gone through uh, the life savings of the family. He's now, he's a, he, has a, he has a small business in, in, in uh, Egypt with his brother-in-law. He's already gone through, the father-in-law's already gone through all of his lifelong earnings, and now he's uh, in savings. Now he's going to sell his business, or he's considering selling his business, which he co-owns with his brother at fire sale pace, so we can buy nine months of that drug. Now, uh, if Bayer is going to ask the United States government to be their big bully for them in cases that they're losing in the courts in India, then you have to take responsibility for the fact that Bayer just doesn't care what happens to people in that situation. Now, I'd like to quote from the CEO of, 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 uh, of not, not the U.S. Bayer, but the, the international Bayer, uh, Deckers. He was at an FT conference on the 3rd of December, and at that, at that, uh, at that, uh, uh, conference he was he was you know he was asked about uh, uh, you know like whether or not this was going to change their uh, their uh, pricing strategy and he said uh, he described the compulsory license as theft and he said quote we did not develop this product for the Indian market let's be honest I mean you know we developed this product for Western patients who can afford this drug quite honestly period now, um, that's really what's going on. 
Now here's, here's another uh, quote, this one from Norvatus, the other company that's involved. Both these companies took products invented in the United States with a lot of government research. Nexavar, by the way, had a 50% tax credit as an orphan drug. The company that developed it was, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's Onyx Pharmaceuticals. They, it, 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 the drug was registered at the end of 2005. In their annual report in 2005, the SEC, they said, quote, aggregate research and development costs dated through December 31, 2005, since Onyx, uh, incurred by Onyx, since fiscal year 2000, for the Exavir project is $134.8 million. That's the number that went into the record in the case in India uh, when Bayer was arguing they spent like three billion dollars on the drug. Now, uh, the, the the quote I wanted to read you, I can see I got the red light flashing here, from uh, uh, from Nervatus, uh That's one that was done by Dr. Druckers and other people. About ninety percent of the early work was done by charities and by the NIH initially. Then it was patented by by Bayer. But it isn't just about that drug. But then. You know, if there's, there's more than 1.2 billion people in India, and the vanishing director of Nirvanas on June 7, 2010, he said that Nirvanas is planning on making its available, uh, its medicines available. Uh, they currently, they said they were making them available to 42 million people, and they want to expand that to 100 million people. 100 million people, the target for Nirvanas is 8% of the population. I would like to be able to submit for the record, um, I really, uh, you know, because, uh, uh, you know, my time is up, uh, a longer statement. I'd also like to submit a copy of the film, Dying for Drugs, that the director, Dylan uh, Gray, has, uh, has, has, has offered to put into the record for this proceeding, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next